Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming today to this film screening. Um, this, this discussion is going to be recorded and put online when the film goes online. We'll find out when that's going to happen from Sam in a moment. Um, so um, I'm Jennifer Turner. I direct the China Environment Forum here. And for the past so oh, eight years or so, we have been having lots of meetings and discussions on the Belt and Road Initiative. But this was unique today. Um, this was, we, we just screened the film Tinderbox, Belt and Road, China in the Balkans which uh, for those of you that you here all watch the films and eventually people online will see it too, that you saw that Chinese investment is pouring into the Balkans and there's been kind of some costs that were made and we can, we can talk a little bit of that. I'm um, just gonna introduce my, my panel here and then we're gonna get to asking questions. I um, already said Sam George here. Um, he's at the Bertelsmann's Foundation's Global Markets and Digital, he's, I'm sorry. Oh, I did it again. He's the Bertelsmann Foundation's Global Markets and Digital Advisor and has and s and been there since 2012. And you told me beforehand you've made something like 15 to 20 documentaries trying to touch on issues, kind of make us look at topics that not everyone's looking at. And I could tell you that I would guess that most people in the room here, you maybe didn't even never heard of this, this issue of what's going on in the Balkans, correct? So, um, so. Could I, we're gonna, you're gonna have three fabulous commentators. I'm gonna ask you a question first, Sam, but we let you know who's here today. We've got, in the red shirt there, we've got uh, Jingjing Zhang, who's a well-known Chinese environmental lawyer, who I met years ago when she was um, litigation director at the uh, Center for Legal Assistance for Pollution Victims in Beijing. Um, now, today, she's, um, she's the founder of the Center for Transnational Environmental Accountability at University of Maryland. And with her center, she's been leading lots of litigation work, that means court cases and suing people, in Africa and Latin America, trying to ensure that Chinese infrastructure projects comply with environmental and human rights norms. And then we also have, next to her, we have uh, Margaret Myers, who is director of the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue. You've published extensively on China and, La and Latin America, and. She just recently, just last week, mm -hmm. left the Wilson Center. She was here for nine months working on research and a book about China, Belt and Road, and Latin America. I'll be interested in your comparative impressions there, uh, Margaret. And then last October, um, it, from a Shanghai quarantine room, <laughs> our last commentator, Christoph Nedepil, he spoke at a webinar that was called Race to the Top on Global Green Infrastructure, from BRI to Blue Dot and beyond. Um, so happy today, I got to meet him in person. He's taller than I thought he was gonna be. <laughs> um, he works at the Green Finance and Development Center at Fudan University, and for many years, you've worked with the Chinese Ministry of Ecological Environment and Academics in China on the question of greening the Belt and Road. So, what a panel. So, I'm gonna, st I'm gonna start with you, Sam, um, asking you a question or two, and then have everyone else kind of making comments, you know, on the film based on your experiences. I guess. First of all, just real quick, how and why did you make? Why did you make this film? Yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, it, it, it's a very oh, good question. Um, and first of all, I just want to start off by saying a, a big thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting this uh, event today, and a, and a thank you to the audience. You know, I know it's tough to jump out in the middle of the day for a full film and conversation, and then it's raining and all this. So, um, I really appreciate it. And, and of course, to be with such a fantastic panel. Um, yeah, so why? Good question indeed. <laughs> I mean, um, I, this was my boss's idea, frankly. And where was her interest? My, we, so we're the Bertelsmann Foundation. We're a nonprofit organization. And I think we're fundamentally issued in transatlantic relations, which is a wonderful thing to say because it's a pretty darn big umbrella. And there's a lot I've been able to get under that. Uh, such as gentrification here in Washington, D.C. We've done a couple documentaries about that, elections. We look at democracy in different parts of the world. And I think her big interest, though, what drew her to this story was this idea of a potential Western. And I use a lot of shortcuts, and the film uses a lot of shortcuts. But by Western, I think we're sort of saying core Europe and the United States to the extent there's been some kind of retreat from these regions, such as the Balkans, um, and whether that created an arena that others could fill. And then I also think a part of that conversation is, of course, this idea of the rise of China and what appears to be a sort of competition going on between this kind of core West 
and China, whether it's for resources, whether it's for economic power, all sorts of different things. So I think her interest was, you know, is the European Union and the United States not active enough in this region? And this is, and I, I don't want to, because I could talk for a long time, and I don't want to do that, but it's such a complicated story, and I'm happy to get into this, because it's like, who's the bad guy here, right? That's one of the really important questions, and it's not clear to me that the European Union is the bad guy. There are very good reasons why it didn't rush to incorporate Serbia, and it's certainly not to say that China is a bad thing. You know, China should absolutely be helping financial projects around the world. It's, it's a very natural behavior of a large uh, superpower. But we can get into that. I guess the last thing I would say about, and I said, well, this sounds wonderful. I can go to some really cool places. But secondly, it just so happened that it's something I know a little bit about because I did my master's degree uh, working on Latin American issues where we read a lot of uh, Dr. Meyer's work. Um, and this, in 2010, was like the number one issue in Latin America. Oh my God, look at what the Chinese are doing here. It's got some good, it's got some bad, but it's very similar to what they were doing 10 years ago in Africa. Now they're doing it in Latin America. So then I come back and, and the primary story around this seemed to be, oh my God, look at what China's doing in the Balkans. That's very similar to what they were doing in Latin America, which is very similar to what they're doing in Africa. And I said, I, I studied this. You know, and this is very, it has enough similarities that it's a pattern. It very much is happening around the world. So for better or for worse, it seemed really important to understand what it is. But, but I did like it, because you did cover it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, I think you have to look at it that way. I mean, there's, the, you talk about the layers to this, and part of it is this layer. You, you have to watch out for this trick to say, well, what China's doing is wrong because we're the good guys. You know, we're the good guys that do democracy and, and, and responsible development. No. I mean, the, look, the United States and the West have done really bad things in the developing world exploitatively uh, for centuries. And so I'm sorry that part of this ends up being viewed by others. I always get this question, yeah, well, isn't the United States bad? Too? Yes, they are. So it's not, it's not to say that one is better than the other. What it is to say is that this is, this is happening, and it may have some good, especially for countries that don't have access to this money, but there are some very troubling elements of it as well. Okay. Why well, don't we go on down the line? Margaret, since he mentioned you, I mean, I... Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, no. yeah well, some response to the film, and, um, yeah. Well, uh, I, Sam alluded to his studies on, on China, Latin America, gosh, uh, over a decade ago, and I was fortunate to meet him back then before he began his, his illustrious career as a, a documentarian, and uh, really, congratulations. This was a fantastic film, and, and um, for me, really striking, as, I, I mean, I focus pretty much exclusively on China's engagement with the Latin American and Caribbean regions. And I'll mention some of the parallels that I, that I noted, but I mean, it really did strike me how much of the story really does resonate in other parts of the world. Um, it's interesting, I mean, it, I think one of the last lines in, in the movie is that in, in, for this particular story, it's sort of just getting started, or the, the, the you know, uh, the Boer story, at least, is, is just beginning. And uh, I mean, as a sort of overarching point, it does strike me, and I see this in the Latin American context in particular, but I'm sure it's a global phenomenon, that we are seeing not an explosion in new engagement. It's been a sort of you know, prolonged you know, for a number of years now in, in Africa for, for several decades, in Latin America for you know, two going on three, um, prolonged engagement, but a real focusing of effort on those sectors uh, that China will need to engage in more extensively to, first of all, address food and energy and security, right, but also supply chain security. And mining in particular, right, whether it's copper or gold or lithium or, you know, or cobalt or these wide-ranging other metals and minerals that are of critical interest to China as it develops a wide range of tech-related and innovative products is something that we're seeing a lot of in the Latin American context and which I imagine is happening elsewhere too. So even though we may be seeing a sort of scaling down of some of the huge projects that we, you know, that were once emblematic of the BRI, uh, we, although we just saw, what was it, a couple days ago, the announcement of a possible port in Tierra del Fuego, but mm -hmm. never mind that. In addition, I mean, but generally we're seeing this explosion in mining activity. So it strikes me that this is also the beginning for a lot of other activity that we'll be seeing in this particular space and then its implications as well. As concerns the parallels with Latin America and the Caribbean, you know, 
It, this notion that it takes two to tango, right, is absolutely <laughs> one that, that, that resonated with me, right? There's a lot of research, just as David Lampton mentioned, about, you know, the extent to which, um, you know, regulations that are in place and also enforced, right? Those are two different things, and both elements are critical, but that those do help to guide uh, and shape Chinese investment. And so if there are high standards in place and they are well enforced, then, then the outcomes are, are generally better. Um, the opposite is true, of course, when, when they are, there are low standards or they are not, not enforced. Um, and so you know, this means that good outcomes depend on good governance in these countries that are receiving these loans and, and investments. And as we all know, and as, we, as was demonstrated here, the, the results there are really mixed. Um, the same is true of other foreign investors, just as you mentioned, uh, Sam. So it's not purely a Chinese, a Chinese phenomenon. But what we do see now is such a scale of Chinese investment in some of these sectors, especially sectors with outsized impact, environmentally speaking. Uh, that the implications are that much greater. Um, in the context of Bohr, right, the Serbian government is practically complicit, it seems, right, even apparently relinquishing full control of the mine and surrounding areas to, to Zedin. Uh, and it's this case, frankly, I, I saw as a bit more extreme even than what I've seen in some in, in much of Latin America. Um, but there are certain, you know, similar cases. The things that come to mind immediately is, you know, Argentina's decision under Christina Kirchner to change the law to allow Chinese companies to not have to bid on projects so long as they brought finance to bear, large-scale infrastructure projects, public works projects, things of that nature. Uh, in Ecuador, the, the um, uh, Chinese company Sino Hydro worked very closely uh, with the Correa government to develop a series of dam projects. One of them, you know, Coca-Cola Sinclair is sort of notorious for the challenges associated with it, both structural challenges, labor-related challenges, and things of this nature. But there was this sort of partnership, this two-to-tango dynamic that we saw playing out. There in Costa Rica, as we talked about the, mo the road in Montenegro, right, there's been this Route 32 <laughs> that has been a very, I mean, it's been developed over the course of a very, very long time uh, with cost overruns and now the government funding a portion of that just to kind of continue the construction and get it to where it needs to be. And then, of course, there's uh, you know, adoption, as was mentioned in the film, of, of um, certain technologies, surveillance technologies and other technologies that, um, in some cases, there are concerns um, you know, potentially uh, you know, dissidents or, or, or opposition, um, uh, but, uh, you know, ECU 911 is one example in the Ecuadorian context, so certainly plenty of, of parallels there. Um, China to the rescue is another sort of interesting takeaway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this has been a, an, an increasingly so, right? When we saw Odebrecht collapse, um, a lot of their projects, also Odebrecht being a major Brazilian right infrastructure company that uh, was the you know that essentially collapsed following corruption allegations, um, and a lot of its assets were were put up for sale. In some cases, they were critical assets, things like dams that were producing a lot of electricity for certain parts of some of these countries in Latin America, and indeed. Countries practically had to beg investors to come to the table and submit bids, and in some cases, Chinese companies were the only ones to do so. And so, in a way, they came to the rescue. And on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, the outcomes again depend on the extent to which the regulations are in place and enforced. Um, I think all of this, this sort of China to the rescue, highlights, in a way, China's continued willingness to take on relatively high risk. Projects, though, you know, my, I, I wonder if, if that tendency is waning a bit now that China has fewer resources to bring to bear and now that there's a new sort of conversation in Beijing about what is risk and what to, um, you know, wh wh how much one ought to take on uh, overseas and where. Um, it also, of course, highlights, you know, the, the lack of interest among other potential investors. And this is a huge sort of theme here. You know, it's, and it's not just the lack of interest, right? Not only are we not seeing people come to the table to invest in new projects, there's a process, at least in the Latin American context, of divestment. So there is a bleeding of, of you know, investment, of, you know, uh, engagement on the part of, of other than Chinese actors, and, you know, be they European or Canadian or from the U.S. or otherwise. 
and I'll, I'll finish very quickly, just you know, looking ahead, uh, you know, there's this dynamic at play in Latin America and elsewhere where in China is a major contributor to the green transformation, right? To green energy technologies uh, is part of the, you know, is a major player in terms of electrification of, you know, entire fleets of buses in many of these cities and, and providing in wind and, and solar. And so there's that component. And then there is this, you know, continuous engagement in sectors with outsized impact on, on the environment and, and with a clear climate-related um, implication. And so understanding how that plays out, how it balances out, is I think worth a lot of our, uh, some dedicated research attention. And so hopefully we'll all be able to take a look at that together. Um, and then I would say also just uh, as a nearly concluding point, um, my sense, in having conversations with a lot of actors in Latin America, there's very little said about and very little sort of considered about China's own challenges with this process, right, that is being brought to bear overseas. Not a lot of talk about the challenges that China faced as, con you know, when implementing its own development model. Uh, infrastructure led, you know, a lot of this industry developing in China and the implications of that from an environmental, social, and other perspective. Um, so that, you know, this China model is viewed, one sees the end state, right, which is this remarkable growth in these shiny cities, but there's less known about what it took to get there. And what really strikes me is, is the way that Zijin approached the appropriation of these properties, right? It, and it's a very similar <laughs> way that you see, you know, done in China, where, wherein you have, you know, first an effort to say, hey, everybody's doing this, you know, best to go ahead and make a deal with us and, and, and leave. And then secondarily, if that doesn't work, to say, okay, it, it, it's gone um, now. And, you, and then you get the chai you know, symbol on the, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it's eventually, to, which means to demolish, right? And then eventually that, that property is gone. And so it w understanding that that exact same model was applied here was really quite, quite striking for me. Um, and then I'll, just as a concluding point, I would say, you know, China itself, and I think this was mentioned in, in the film as well, but is now grappling with the effects of its model of growth and production. You know, what growth and progress, but at what cost and how to address the, you know, the externalities associated with, with all of this. And there are indeed efforts to, to think of new policies and to, to clean things up in certain cases and to think about greening the BRI. Um, but these conversations and, and related objectives, you know, are much more apparent at home. <laughs> in my view at least, and, and you know, maybe we'll hear otherwise, but then they are overseas. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about ESG prior to that about CSR. But in my view at least, you know, when we're talking ESG, environment, social, right, and governance, it's the E that gets all the focus, but the E is mainly just achieving emissions-related objectives, right, to get to a certain level in time to meet what goals have been established by, by the government and the party. So in any case, it's not is not holistic, <laughs> um, and uh, I, 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 I worry that these conversations are not being had you know, overseas as well. Ideally, they will transition eventually, and, and that will be the case. So, but in any case, thank you great. very much for the opportunity and, and for the opportunity to see this film. Thank you, that was great comments. Um, <laughs> can we go down the line? Okay, Jing Jing, do you wanna say something about the film and, and, and bring the mic up? Thanks. Sure, um, well, I get uh, the, the invitation from you to come to join this uh, after film uh, discussing. I said, how could I reject uh, this, uh, this opportunity to talk about uh, one specific company which uh, appeared in my career at least uh, three times. And so Zijin and this your, uh, the subject uh, filmed in this um, uh, documentary. Uh, I wonder how many people remember what happened 10 years, about 10 years ago in China, and this company got the highest uh, administrative penalty uh, because the mining tender collapsed in the home um, province uh, in Shanghai County in, in Fujian province. And uh, the time I still working in uh, my, uh, on my old capacity as an uh, environmental litigator, in Beijing, working for the Center for uh, Pollution uh, Legal Assistance to Pollution Victims, and a group of uh, us, uh, the NGO Civil Society Organization, uh, have uh, intense discussing how we file uh, environment uh, public interest litigation against Zijin because of that uh, mining 
and then it collapsed. Uh, that collapse uh, killed about uh, uh, 26, I remember, if I uh, remember it uh, wrong, the correctly, it's about uh, 26 uh, villagers downstream uh, were killed uh, in that collapse. And it happened uh, again in the same year in uh, neighboring province, Guangxi. So that was a two significant um, uh, mining disaster. Man-made is not a natural-made disaster. So that was the first time Zijin came to my, um, my uh, caught my attention because uh, um, that um, mining collapse um, the 10 years ago. And uh, it came to my attention again in 2019 when I took the, my trip was invited by the NGO uh, from Bosnia. Uh, invite me to take an uh, investigation trip with them. We, uh, we dropped from uh, Serbia um, to um, Tuzla, um, one of the coast city in uh, Bosnia. And we drove to quite close to Bor and uh, smelt. Uh, that was early time, then January 2019. <coughs> and it, uh, Zijin was just uh, about to start uh, the operation. The mining, uh, the smelter has already been running for more than 30 years, I, I remember. So there, there were a lot of problems, issue, pre-existing condition there. Um, we didn't stop, uh, we just passed by, and but I heard about that project. And when I arrived to Tuzla, and um, uh, I uh, took this deep breath, I said, smell like home, um, smell like the coal burning, <laughs> um, <laughs> smell like the, late 1990s in uh, Beijing, when I pursued my master's law in, in Beijing, the same, uh, the same smell really make me th think about the, my home, my second home, Beijing. So that was my s the second time Zijin um, caught my attention. The last time was last year, I took a trip to Colombia and uh, we went to, we were, I was uh, one of the speakers for a local journalist training and on the reporting Chinese investment in Latin America. So we took um, a field trip and we went to Zijin's uh, investment mining <laughs> site and uh, used to, uh, that mining site used to owned by Canadian uh, continental uh, gold mine and uh, Zijin bought uh, the site. And it the same, the same pattern it has a pre-existing conditions. And we were in the middle of the demonstration uh, by the local community. And we were surrounded by the angry, uh, very angry um, local community because of water issue. So that was three times and I encountered Zijin and uh, the, the talking about the pattern, that is the pattern I have been seeing uh, since uh, my very early time, I grew up in a state-owned chemical factory in Sichuan province. I saw the, the pollution when I grew up, and uh, I saw this pattern of the pollution when I was an environmental litigator in Beijing. I have been on many sites, uh, like Bo, and you said it's uh, not familiar with that. I'm very familiar with mm -hmm. the site, <laughs> the same uh, condition I have been seeing from China, my home country to those um, Chinese investment recipient country in Africa, in Latin America, in Bosnia, and in Serbia, of course. And so the, the pattern is there. We have been seeing um, this, uh, based on my own um, uh, experience um, as a citizen, Chinese citizen, as an environment lawyer in China, and now in Africa and Latin America, globally, I can say. And I certainly see this independent Chinese companies uh, have been brought to their uh, business model uh, to the world. And uh, so another, um, the pattern I've been seeing is where are those, um, where are those laws, um, regulations, rules, and uh, we talk about the rule-based system. I do see the pattern. The, the, if Chinese company in invest in those uh, countries with uh, stronger institutions, stronger rules, and uh, stronger in enforcement of uh, laws, Chinese company tend to behave better than those place with a weaker institution. So that is another pattern I've been seeing. Mm -hmm. And where are those laws from both ends? In 
at, in China and in the host country, in the host country, the Chinese investment and recipient countries, and the China, end of the China, um, how um, when we saw all those good policies and the good strong environment uh, laws regulation, and our home country China, and how um, that those laws and regulation can allow the uh, Zijing and other. Con on Chinese companies with notorious environment performance continue in investing in other country. How could that happen if China has a pre-screening uh, process and to stop those uh, harmful projects to go to other country, to harm other country, other communities? So that is a question from the end of the China and from the host countries. And certainly we saw here in Serbia they must have no laws, and uh, they're about to uh, join the EU, and the EU does have a, a quite strong environment regulation uh, standards. And Serbia, is, I believe, there are laws, but the, where are the in not enforcement? Being enforced, yeah. Yeah, so that okay. is what I want to see, the pattern. Yep. From, yeah. All right, so we're going to hop up. So you're, on the, you're like the good guy here, sailing in <laughs> with your green hat. like so. From in China, there is a recognition that some of this overseas investment needs to be improved. Can you maybe make some comments on that? You know, reflect on the film and, and your background and you and your compatriots on your horses with green hats are trying to uh, <laughs> make it better. I'll try to do my best, Jennifer. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, wonderful to be here with you all. Um, and uh, congratulations also for making um, the film. So uh, I will speak a little bit from my heart as well. Um, about green development, so I'm, uh, as Jennifer introduced me, I'm the director of the Green Finance and Development Center at Fudan University, where our role is very much to work with the international community and the Chinese community in policy making, finance, and so on, on greening the Belt and Road Initiative. And I've been doing this for the last uh, five years, and uh, um, I think we've luckily been able to make some significant progress, including, for example, uh, supporting the coal exit of China and uh, also the green development guidance with the traffic light system, where we talked about uh, last time, Jennifer, yep. when I was uh, indeed on a, a quarantine hotel uh, toilet. Sitting. Yeah, he was <laughs> filming from the bathroom. It was awesome, but you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so I think kind of I, I want to kind of uh, structure my intervention in three parts. First, kind of where are we coming from? Kind of uh, I think that's important. I think in many ways the film showed a little bit also this uh, notion of where we're coming from, a little bit uh, very traditional. It's like, ah, oh, it's dirty, it's uh, depth trap, and uh, some of these um, very well-known mm, kind of catchphrases. And I think there is, but you, al you also showed, I think David Lampton in, in the film highlighted it quite nicely. It's like, I think we have to understand the pragmatism of Chinese overseas engagement. Um, if it's, if a country, has a kind of not strong governance system, Ch China is not going to improve the governance system. If a country has strong governance system, China is going to comply with the governance system. I think that's from the Chinese perspective. But I think from the host country perspective, we also have to understand there's just a whole lot of development need. We need a lot more infrastructure. And where are we getting that from? And I think, uh, I think that's just a reality. That's where we're coming from. I think what's also interesting and you highlighted that um, particularly also with the road project. And so we also work with a number of developers and kind of trying to understand right now we have a project, um, why projects fail and um, to learn kind of how we can improve projects and how we can make them uh, yeah, more sustainable. And one of the interesting aspects why projects fail is indeed the overall project financing model, which we know in the West kind of for, for many years kind of have honed it and kind of risk management and risk uh, diversification. Um, this is not something that is as natural to Chinese developers as we think it should be. Um, they have these huge projects, but uh, the governance system with, in which they grew up in, which is mostly within China, there's very little political risk. It's very little social risk. The financing um, is pretty clear. And so kind of distributing that risk is challenging. At the same time, a lot of the developers just go out and actually want to have a contract. So it does not matter whether the road makes a lot of money because they had a construction contract. <laughs> so I think kind of these things is where we are coming from. I think where we are, um, where we are going. 
green is indeed extremely important for the Chinese. Um, green development, um, we just had three weeks ago a very big um, lifting up of green development again with the, with the, couple, with the Minister of en Environment um, where the green development guidance which um, kind of in was published in 2020 in which I was very much involved in the development of um, got another boost um, it was all over the Chinese media that now kind of green development uh, of the BRI kind of is really much more enshrined. Over the last years, we've seen um, this green principles um, included in a, a number of uh, guidances for overseas developers, so that's kind of on the construction side, and for the financial institutions, which are, of course, providing a lot of the financing. So there is actual action happening. Um, definitely not enough. That don't, get me wrong, don't get me wrong that we are any, anyway kind of fully succeeding. But I think the direction is very clear. We just had, um, last week, we had in Budapest a big um, European trade fair. Most of the exhibitors were solar panel producers, wind producers. So all of the green technologies that China is trying to export into um, the Western world. At the same time, the other aspect where we're going to, or the other uh, direction that we're going to, and we've been going to very strongly, so we follow, like one of the publications that we do is we track Chinese overseas financing. And we, every half year we publish the BRI investment report. And the other big um, chunk is, of course, resources, natural resources. And that's where a lot of the financing is going to. So when we have Tikin, I think it's, of course, one of those resource-backed deals which are also much easier to finance. Where we're going away from, by the way, is um, roads. Um, it's just too expensive, and right now there's no public finance to support a lot of these roads. So it's kind of a lot less. We still have some, but it's um, much less. Now, what I wish, kind of, if I, if I might close with that, um, number one, I think if I see this movie, I, it feels a little bit like pointing the finger at China, and kind of not that you try to do that, but it still kind of leaves the impression, and maybe I'm also a little bit oversensitive to that by now. I think what frustrates me as a German uh, sitting here, kind of have been educated here in the West and living in China. It's like, why don't we follow our own recipes? Mm. Um, we constantly kind of tell China, <laughs> it's like, be greener and uh, put the environmental standards up, put the social standards up. It's like, okay, let's follow our own recipes. Second, um, can we provide alternatives? Are we really providing alternatives? I mean, you just mentioned it. We are divesting from a lot of the places. Um, who's providing the financing? Um, who's providing um, also the technology? Um, who's providing the markets for exports. So I think that's extremely, extremely important. Um, and the third aspect that I really wish for is I think we should try to find ways to cooperate better with China. Mm. Um, then I think that's, uh, of course, becoming more complicated. Um, but so <laughs> we have to build trust. And it's kind of, of course, the Chinese have to build trust. But in the end, everybody has to build trust. Trust is absolutely mutual. That means also be honest. One little thing kind of I found uh, interesting in the movie when you kind of showed kind of the face recognition cameras, those were from my home country. They were Bosch cameras. And Katrain was the antenna that you, that you showed in the film. They were not Huawei cameras. They were German <laughs> cameras. Bosch and Katrain was the technology. So kind of we have to be uh, kind of careful and be, be honest kind of also about um, our own stuff. That doesn't mean kind of that we should kind of uh, kind of accept a lot of the things that are happening in China. And this uh, kind of, uh, I'm happy to talk with that, oh, not on camera. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, kind of, I think, kind of I really want to end. I think there's a lot of mutual opportunities. There's a lot of financing and financing strength and capacity development strength and institutional strength in the West that is absolutely needed for supporting development. And there's a lot of infrastructure building strength also in China that is extremely relevant for us to manage the green transition, whether it's in solar or wind um, or many other technologies in transport you mentioned yeah. it before. So I think um, this kind of mutual opportunities we should um, foster much more. Thank you so much. And um, we're, I wanted to take some questions from the audience, and you can then you can make some responses. But y'all want to get the, these these good people who came and are not just here for popcorn, I assume. Um, can you raise your hand? So Judy Shapiro, so, um, uh, you mean right here, the, right here, hand her the microphone, please. Thanks. And just introduce yourself briefly. Yes, I'm. Yeah, it's, a, it's on. I'm Judy Shapiro. <laughs> Thank you. Um, from American University. From American University. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Jennifer. Um, actually, I just want to underline something that none of the panelists mentioned, because I think all of us who've been following these kinds of issues are struck by the pattern and how amazing it is the way the Chinese duplicate overseas what you know just looks like a Chinese situation. But what I had not seen before, 
I made just wanted to flag this is um, these Vietnamese. Um, the use of basically slave labor overseas. I was very familiar with the notion that the Chinese prefer to bring their own laborers over because they're used to that way of working and who knows what's going on and whether they're being paid and all this. But these Vietnamese, it reminds me much more of the situation on the um, big fishing vessels where um, people are lured essentially onto the high seas and then they can't get off the boat like ever. Um, so just that was something very fresh for me in this film. My comp is not a question. And how about pass down to Phil? It was fresh and depressing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Philip Cho with the uh, uh, NGO Oceana, and um, I work a lot on uh, these high seas fishing issues. Uh, one one of the questions I have uh, around China's recognition and desire for leadership, uh, both around environmental and and social aspects, is their oversight over companies like Zijin. What is the discussion in China now in terms of mitigation uh, on that risk from these companies who have been documented to uh, act in the ways they, they are? Um, because it, it seems to me this, for example, this company has been allowed to continuously uh, behave in this manner in various places and given the authority that uh, the Chinese government has, I, I'm, I'm quite surprised that um, you know, there haven't been either a framework put in place to have tighter oversight on how these companies move out uh, and work in places uh, or, or direct sanctions. Uh, thank you. If okay. anybody wants to. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe um, let's get this question right here, Jennifer, and then we'll have you guys respond to that. So question of oversight. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jing Wu from MC International. I'm a China fellow. Uh, so uh, obviously coming from a human rights background, uh, BRI is kind of notorious for its human rights violations around the world. They often confiscated the passports of their workers. They withhold their uh, salaries. And yeah, I think to piggyback on the gentleman here, uh, so have there been efforts within the Chinese government, you know, from a Chinese aspect uh, to address these issues, or they really just don't care at all? What do you think? Do you want to start off? Or? Yeah, I'm happy to start off. And uh, first, I just want to say all three, I really appreciate what you said. And there's a lot of uh, truth being said and really good comments as well. Um, and and I think your point was, I'm, I'm, how did I want to respond to this? Um, <laughs> Let me let me just pass for a second because <laughs> uh, it, 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 it slipped my mind. Oh, I know what I was going to say. And I think this is really important because I think your point is, is fair. And that is there is a flaw with this documentary, right, that I, that I accept and that I live with and that I really tried to make it different. And that's that you really don't get a whole lot of the Chinese perspective, right? That's something that really would have made this better. I mean, we were able to get... And, it, and it's not even just a lack of government officials. It, it extends also to even academics or members of civil society. And it wasn't for lack of trying. And I even have close friends that work on this issue um, that said that, that are experts on it. They're doing PhDs on it. And they say they're from China. And they say, you know, I'd love to talk to you on this, but I just can't. I can't go on record talking about these issues. And I think what the result is is this sort of China will not communicate what they're doing. And as a result, I think all these conspiracy theories just flourish about the debt trap, for example, that you mentioned, that this is part of their genius plan to have a country like Montenegro owe them a billion dollars that they're never going to be able to pay. And you stop and think about it, you say, well, maybe that's not a genius plan after all, to suddenly be <laughs> out of a billion dollars that you're not going to get back. And so I think often we do read into these, these really kind of cynical interpretations, but I think that comes from the lack of transparency on the Chinese side, and I simply don't understand it. If they don't want to be a part of my documentary, fine, that's not going to change the world. But you know, they really could make a case for themselves. They could, they could say, look, you guys do it too. They could say that. They could say, you know, if without us, there would be no infrastructure, there would be no mine, all these jobs would be gone in Boer. 
Um, so there, there's certainly a defense that can be made, but they just don't make it. And um, I think that comes back to haunt them. And, and that's one thing I found on this trip that I think there would be a real benefit if they would engage more about what they're trying to do, because I think the lack of it is where a lot of these, you know, that there's some master plan out there. It leaves a lot of space for other people mm -hmm. to spin that narrative. That's the point I wanted to make. Yeah. And what about, I don't know if you wanted to come, the, the issue of the, the tr efforts for transparency on human rights, I don't know, in Latin America, or maybe, I think this is Jing Jing's territory here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so try to be short with your answer so we can get yeah, to other questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, the you know the human rights impact and the uh, and environment impact are always uh, together almost uh, because the, now the right to uh, clean and healthy environment is uh, uh, human rights. So we have been seeing a lot of the violation of the right to clean uh, environment uh, done by those uh, the, some uh, Chinese uh, in invest project. That is for sure. And um, talking about uh, the the uh, regulation or or the um, oversight uh, say, uh, Chinese companies' behaviors. And uh, certainly in, in China, you see uh, there's a, a sophisticated monitoring and reporting uh, requirement, legal requirement. So the government can uh, get ac uh, access to the emission data or the, and the other environment performance. And, uh, but there is no such uh, uh, system or regulation regulatory regime on the Chinese companies uh, in overseas subsidiary. And if the companies do not report back, and how could the Chinese government uh, get to know those, uh, the performance? And how can the government take any measure to mitigate their negative impact? There is no such uh, law, uh, law and uh, system uh, inside in place to enforce any good uh, attention, green uh, BRI, policy, uh, the, the, uh, we can see that there is good uh, uh, political will to make the Chinese overseas investment green and clean, but uh, there's no system to enforce, uh, to make it measure, make it real action. Um, so th that, that is an uh, issue. If you see the Zijing's uh, annual report on, their, uh, on its own environment performance uh, globally, you won't see anything what we saw from the film. So there is no any uh, honest uh, reporting on in that uh, annual report. I, I roughly, I, I, I haven't seen that. Um, we, I have been seeing a lot of this uh, Chinese company over, uh, overseas subsidiary caused negative impact and didn't see um, the report in their annual report, um, which those on the Shanghai, Shenzhen, or Hong Kong Stock Exchange, they are required to um, disclose important um, co corporate information. They're not um, doing that. Can, um, Christoph, in, in terms of like, I know you focus more on the, the green BRI, but are, are for, for labor standards and issues, is there, is there like your, is, is there an equivalent kind of push both in the research and on the BRI improvement that, that, that's happening in China? Is there, is there a focus at all on overseas labor? Yeah, not, I'm not familiar with that. I, but I kind of, if I, yeah, please. I, think that, I think kind of to your point, it's, it's actually very interesting kind of also coming back to your point. I think the transparency issue is of course uh, difficult and kind of how can we hold anyone accountable if we don't have any transparency? I think that's a extremely difficult question. And I think what the Chinese, what I feel that at least in the environmental space that the uh, Chinese government has understood that their governance system is just so unique um, that compared to international companies that are not also not held accountable, obviously, by their governments. So if a d German company goes and pollutes another country, the German government is not going to do anything about it. There's no jurisdiction um, ab about that, mostly. Um, but the Chinese know that, of course, there's not an international shareholder pressure. There's not an international um, civil society pressure on them. So overall, they understand that the government has to take a stronger role. and at least it's not moving away kind of, it's not getting worse. I think it's actually getting in a better direction of trying to understand better. That's why the Ministry of Commerce has an office pretty much in all of the countries that it operates in, in order to try to find out. China's also thinking about introducing grievance mechanisms um, for a lot of the overseas um, projects in order for financial institutions to get better information. And the financial institutions that are financing a lot of the projects are also extremely worried about cost overruns that are caused by social unrest. So I think, I think kind of 
you are very important and kind of <laughs> NGO, local NGOs are indeed extremely important to kind of bring these cases, kind of make them costly if they're not complying with local standards mm. or international standards. And China has in many guidances said we need to apply international standards. So kind of making sure that these are met is in many ways the role of local NGOs, local partners to shine the light on where maybe some others don't want to shine the light on. And, and I think also local government. I mean, a big part of why this is possible is because the government has abdicated responsibility over this area. Um, so that's where I think it is a big story here. And that's why, you know, it, it could be, you know, why are we diving into Serbian politics? This is completely irrelevant. No, it's, it, it is relevant because it's because of the conditions. They're the ones that take two to tango that are ultimately <laughs> allowing for this kind of thing to happen with minimal oversight. Okay. Do we have another question here? So, gentleman in the middle, and then woman in the left, in the red in the back. We'll do one, two. All right, Eddie Becker. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting. I wonder if there is a technology or a method of cleaning these places up, or mining without producing arsenic, or all of the lead and all of this stuff. And I see the tendency here in the United States is is to push towards deregulation. I mean, the the court ruling that that they can't restrict what's being put in the air. They can't restrict companies for doing that. Uh, Congress, is, Congress is basically pay to play and deregulation. So uh, everything is open as they bring critical infrastructure back into the United States with an absolute deregulation to allow them to do exactly what, what's being done in other countries to make it profitable for the stockholders. I mean, uh, is there any place or any technology that that works, and is it possible for, for people who have that technology to work together to make something that's more sustainable? Excellent, very difficult. So hold on to that for a moment, but you know, can, can this copper mining be clean and green? Yes, in the back. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, hi, my name is Jacqueline Burr. Um, my question is kind of more about the response to a lot of this, mainly there's been a lot of calls over the past few years to make an effort and respond to the things that are going on, especially because there are a lot of good and bad parts of everything going on with BRI. So um, specifically, what do you think about the United States' action to balance out and respond to BRI with the Build Back Better World Initiative? And um, especially with the themes of, themes of hypocrisy that y'all have been going over, like it, the U.S. has done some not great stuff too, you know. So, just kind of, what would y'all think about that? And is it enough? And if not, what else should they be doing? One thing is, you do have to go back and watch the meeting where where Christoph spoke before. But no, there's a good answer. So, why don't we start off with the first one? Um, could could the mining be cleaner? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how? Give us an. I mean, so what could be done? Of course, the technology you mentioned that there. Uh, there are higher uh, technologies require higher on uh, the emission on the standard and it uh, could be used, but be costly and uh, cost the company money to install the higher uh, technology on uh, the better equipment like, uh, to reduce uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, other mm -hmm. um, there's uh, scrubbers you could put on yeah and uh, but uh, it require funding require uh, financial uh, support from, uh, either from government or from the company and who can pay that clean technology that is a question and another I think is more important uh, that is uh, stronger law enforcement. It does not require a higher technology to make it clean and green. Just if the company can apply to the, um, the current available um, emission standard, and that won't uh, cause the, the same result here. And that I think that is more important, uh, uh, the law enforcement and uh, the raise uh, the, the enforcement. I think that that is most important, better, uh, more important than technology, higher technology. Yeah. That is my answer to the, the, yeah. the question. And, and should, should highlight too that the copper that's being processed there, I mean, that is one of the minerals that's also being used for the electric vehicles. And yeah. so the, this, the Wilson Center has been doing, we've had a lot of meetings talking about different angles of the critical minerals. And so it's going into clean tech and everyone, you know, I, I want, I want we need it cheaper. Yeah. The third is um, uh, prevention is better than the after effect uh, clean up. If we s s foresee the problem would happen, why should we, uh, until the pr 
the harms occur and then we clean up. The development first and the clean up the second, that uh, pattern or that uh, the, the, the road uh, China have uh, taken and uh, now uh, China has changed and they export to other country. Should we take that uh, the develop uh, first and clean up second, uh, that uh, mode of development? And I think all the world, we have to say no to that pattern. We cannot uh, afford uh, this uh, costly pattern that costs our entire planet. Uh, and yeah, so that's Ma Margaret, what about in, in Latin America? Uh, have you, have yeah. there been, because like, there's a lot of investment in mining, not just the Chinese. Is a there some cleaner mines? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, look, the, uh, just as was mentioned in, in the film, right, the, there, there are always going to be some environmental, you know, effects or externalities associated with some of these extractive projects. Where you encounter problems frequently in Latin America, and, and actually there have been some issues, right, with, with uh, wastewater that, um, that have been identified in Chinese projects and that Chinese companies have worked very hard to address very quickly and have, you know, implemented their own new technologies to try to, to resolve um, in, you know, a timely manner. And so there are those, those cases, absolutely. But Cynthia Sanborn, who was a fellow here, also and is at Univers uh, Universidad del Pacifico, Pacific University in Lima, has made the point, too, in, in some of our previous meetings that there, then this is not a China problem, right? It's a, it's a Latin America problem. That in a lot of Latin American countries, the sort of approval processes, um, especially for mine expansions, for example, or greenfield projects, right, of other sorts, sort of happen in a nonlinear way. So you'll have the project approval happening at the same time as the environmental impact assessment happening at the same time as you know other sort of regulatory elements and, and approval elements are happening. So it's not as though they're waiting for the results for one thing to, you know, before making a decision about the next. And so you end up with all sorts of challenges when you get to the end state and the project is approved and maybe there were some irregularities or problems along the way that now aren't going to be addressed as perhaps they should have been. So it's as much a sort of you know, regulatory structural issue as it is um, you know, a, a, a tech technological or, or you know, um, uh, you know, finding new advanced mechanisms for addressing some of these things or implementing them during the, you know, the cleanup process. So I, I just think that's a, a, you know, worth mentioning. And I can talk about the, the Build Back what Better World. Yeah, could you yeah, give that quick. and then maybe Christoph and then we'll let him yeah, and I'll, I mean, I'll be very quick about this, but we've had several iterations of this now, right? I mean, there was America Crece in the Latin American context. There was Build Back Better World that, you know, is was more global in nature, and, and there are a series of new sort of um, efforts on the part of the Biden administration, you know, executive efforts to address some of the sort of gaps in some of our trade uh, agree existing trade agreements and to implement them both in the Pacific and in, in the Latin American context. Um, all of this, I think, is well-meaning. It's obviously an effort to compete more effectively with China while engaging with, with these countries more extensively from an economic perspective. But, you know, these are, all of them are consistently private sector-led. And that's a challenge when the private sector sees considerable risk in these regions. This is a, these are regions in recovery. There is extensive political transition underway. As I mentioned, there's a process of divestment rather than investment. So, you know, this is the this is the challenge, and and the financing that's being brought to bear, whether by the DFC or or others, is in either not enough to compete, you know, really on real terms. Um, uh, it's projects, they can, they're doing a few projects, right, but just the scale is very low. Um, or, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's simply, it's simply um, not enough. And then trade, as we know, is, is, is off the table, right? Um, we're paralyzed in that respect, and so aside from these sort of executive mechanisms, there's not a lot that can be done in that, in that sense. Uh, and so, um, it's not to say that, uh, that nothing's being done. It's just that in terms of you know shifting the needle, it's not going to accomplish a lot. Um, ideally, though, you know this is encouraging more in the way of engagement, at least in certain projects of interest to to the region and that are deemed you know um, to be sustainable and and beneficial in some form. So better something than than nothing. <laughs> Well, maybe, I don't know if to, I'd like to ask you, Sam, to kind of bring us out here, and then we can all chat over popcorn afterwards. But um, I, you did a great, it's a great film. Yeah. And I, Thank you. to your credit, not getting Chinese to talk, except that one slightly terrified gentleman 
who <laughs> had the Foreign Affairs Office listening on his phone, I think. <laughs> it was such an interesting shot. Yeah, it felt like a script. It was one of those things where you had to think about using it because it's sort of unfair in a sense because you take this basically 50 minutes worth of conversation and just dump it on this guy's shoulder who suddenly, like, <laughs> because of his positioning as one of the few Chinese people speaking in yeah. the film, suddenly it takes on such a bigger meaning. So it's something we had to think about before using, but there just was so much interesting there. You could just sort of feel his kind of fear of talking, but wanting to talk, and the fact that he says, you know, it feels like back in China, which is... That's <laughs> the air quality was there. <laughs> ...concerns are, so uh, it, it was an interesting moment, and I just, you know, I appreciate it. It's such an incredibly complicated topic. This is by far the most complicated film topic I've ever tried to cover, um, and, and I, I think your point is really a good one about, if anything, it should be a motivational tool that if we do... In the film, I always say, we claim to support democracy. We claim to support clean energy. You know, I went and showed this film in Europe, and one of the stops was King's College, and I arrived in Heathrow Airport, and something never happened to me before happened. I got through customs. There was no human. It was just a machine that passed me through customs. It looked at me <laughs> and somehow determined that I was the same person that my passport said. And I'm thinking, here we are talking about this system of surveillance uh, as being a threat from China when it's used at maybe the most busy Western airport in the world. Um, and it, but it's just so common. So you said, okay, we need to be better. We need to be more active. We need to be make ourselves available for these infrastructure because there is an infrastructure deficit. But it's, it's, it, that's hard too because the projects aren't making money. They're losing money in a lot of cases. So how can you make a private firm do it? So you say, well, that's what the World Bank is for. But the problem is the World Bank takes forever. Why does it take forever? Because it does a public tender process. Because it makes sure there's no corruption going on on the back end. So it's, already, it's hard to also say, well, the World Bank isn't doing a good job because it's slower. Um, it's just a very complicated project, and, and I, I appreciate the chance to share it. And I would just close by saying, on behalf of the Bertelsmann Foundation, our documentaries are freely available. We're always happy to do these kind of screenings. We don't have a kind of agenda. We just like to have this important conversation. Okay, well, can we thank this uh, great filmmaker and the panelists? <laughs> and if you walk out into the lobby, we've got little bags of popcorn. You can go for savory or sweet. Thank you very much. <laughs>